uh, success which gives you influence. And that's the concept I'm trying to communicate to you as we share these thoughts. Uh, the school of influence uh, is really based on the level of success that you have. Uh, I was thinking, for example, LeBron James, one of the top basketball players in the world today, was simply a young man from a high school. But his success in sports makes him celebrated. The word celebrate is where we get our word celebrity from. A celebrity is someone who the majority of the people celebrate and therefore they consider them to be people of influence. His success as his, a basketball professional on the court gives him influence in so many other areas. A young man won the MVP last night. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, he was telling a story yesterday uh, when he got the award last night about his mother bringing him up as a single parent and how she contributed his life. But he was unknown. His success, I think it's a Kevin Durant is his name, uh, he really became influential last night because of the MVP, most valuable player in basketball. And again, I want you to understand the principle behind that. The principle is... If you become successful in an area of your life, you really become influential in the areas of life. And so the goal is to really become successful. I'm giving an example of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came out of that little village called Nazareth, Nazareth only had 11 houses. That was being down. And it had one street. I went to visit Nazareth over 27 years ago before it was built up. And they did excavations. The archaeologists found the original Nazareth. And Nazareth was built around a well because wherever people found water, that's where they built a city or a village. And they discovered that Nazareth only had 11 houses. No wonder why Jesus was well known in that little town. When he went back to them, they said, you know, can any good thing come out of this little town? They said, you know, who do you think you are? But it was really a settlement. But when he was about to begin his ministry, he had to do something successful. What did he do? He went looking for a problem. Hmm. You know, if you are a basketball team and you're losing... You want to find a player who can solve your problem. The Miami Heat went shopping and hired four players to solve their problem. They had never won championships. So they went looking for who? Solutions. Success begins with identifying a problem to solve. So Jesus Christ knew if I'm going to be successful, I must succeed in something. So he, he went looking for a problem. He found one. He found 12, sorry, he found three young men at that time sitting on the beach with an empty boat. That was a problem. They were professionals. They didn't know what to do with their problem. What did he do? He offered to solve their problems. What did he use? His gift. What was his gift? The gift of dominion. And he told them to go back out. Wrong location, wrong depth, and net on the wrong side. And he solved their problem. Now, what happened after that? Do you remember what happened after that? It says, Peter said to him, what manner of man are you? In other words, you just separated yourself from normal men. That's what that means. We thought you was a normal person. Success begins with separating yourselves from the pack. What manner of person are you? Why? Because you solved a problem that we couldn't solve. You used the gift we didn't know you had. Immediately, 
he became celebrated. He became a celebrity. No wonder why they were willing to drop their nets, shut down their fishing company, and join him. Because he became what? Successful in an area of life. Therefore, he became influential. Influence is the capacity to cause other people to listen to you or to follow you. What is influence? Oh dear. I guess I'm talking to myself. Let me talk to myself. Talk to the hand. Influence is the capacity to cause other people to listen to you or to follow you. That's influence. Suddenly they decided to listen to him. Then they went even to the point where they said, we will follow you. Influence is when other people change their priorities for yours. What is influence? When other people change their priorities for yours. It's influence. So the reason why we focus on success is because success brings you influence. And I'm going to move very fast tonight because I want to get to these 10 keys. And then for the rest of the year, we are going to deal with each one of these keys. And we're going to deal with national influence. Because you will never be successful until you have influence. And you will never have influence until you are successful. They are connected. So I want to begin to talk about then the origins and the nature of success. Our focus in this session is going to be on the role of laws and rules in personal success. Write that down please. The role of laws and rules in personal success. There's one point I want you to leave this class with tonight, and it's this. There's a difference between a law and a rule. And rules can actually stop you from being successful. We'll explain this in this session. Anyone who wants to be successful must break the rules. Please listen to carefully. I'm going to give you a, an important lesson tonight. Your failure in life or your lack of success in life is related to the fact that you obey the rules. Are you thinking? So don't confuse laws with rules. I want you to look at this slide, if you can see it from where you are, and I want you to Say out loud the words that you see in this slide. Ready? Any word. Go. Intelligence. Imagination. Motivation. Time. Courage. Confidence. Ideas. Hard work. Creativity. Will. Focus. Intelligence. Imagination. And what's the last word? What's the big word? Success. I pulled out this slide because this slide has all the principles that lend to success. And each one of those words you may try and remember. Intelligence. Motivation. Imagination. Will. Very important. Confidence, creativity, hard work, hmm? courage, time, very important, 
You don't rush into success. So success is really an integration of a number of principles we're going to talk about tonight. I want to talk about these 10 keys or these 10 laws of success that I have used in my own life. And these keys or laws are immutable. They are also universal and they can work anywhere in the world. These laws have no respect for your ethnic background, your pigmentation. They have no respect for your family upbringing or your culture because laws are universal. They work for anyone if you learn them. Now, we talk about success. I want to quickly define success for you so that you don't think that success is something else. Everybody wants to be successful, correct? I mentioned to you in my last few sessions that success is predictable, failure is predictable. And the reason why success and failure are predictable is because Everything was designed to function by laws. And laws make things predictable. Laws make life predictable. Write that down. All life is predictable because of laws. And the reason why everything has laws attached to it is because God created everything to succeed. And that success is related to God's reputation. He wants to protect his reputation through his creation. Whatever God created is supposed to work. It's supposed to succeed. Whether it's a bird flying or fish swimming or a tree bringing, you know, it's fruit. Everything has to work by laws. That means you were designed by God as God's number one highest creation. Which means that then God has to create some laws by which you succeed to make his reputation successful. In other words, success is good for God. Now, success is not a pursuit. This is important. If you want to be successful in life, don't try to be successful in life. People are failures because they try to be successful. Successful people didn't try to be successful. They simply followed some laws. In other words, success is a result of obedience to laws. What did I say? Talk loud back to me. What did I say? Write that down and tweet that to somebody right now. Hashtag Miles Monroe. Success is what? A result. It's not a pursuit. In other words, success is a byproduct of an activity that you are involved in. LeBron James had no desire to be successful. He desired to be the best player, that's all. So he followed some rules. Last night, I heard them interview him after the Miami basketball team won by 20 points. And they asked him a question. They said, how did you do it? He said, well, we had a few days off. And instead of resting... We spend all the time on the gym shooting. In other words, on their break, they were working. What was he doing? He was following one of the laws. Hard work even when you're off. He was telling us that his success is not something he desired to pursue, but rather he was more concerned about working a law. So that's important to understand. What is success? Let me define a couple of thoughts for you. First of all, success is not what you've done compared to what others have done. Why? Because you'll always find somebody less than you and better than you. So you can actually claim to be the first in the class and still be a poor student. I remember that happened to me when I was a kid in, in, in Western Prep School here in the Bahamas. I went home and I was so excited. I got 48 on a test. 48. And I got the top mark in the class. I went home and showed my mother my 
exams, my test. And my mother punished me. She said, you got first in the class at 48, two things has to happen. Number one, the teacher need to be fired. And number two, you are a disgrace. That means everybody got less than 48. She said, 48 out of what? And that was the question. 48 out of what? See, success is not measured by what you've done compared to others. Success is measured by what you've done compared to what you were supposed to do. You were supposed to get 100. So 58 at the top of the class is failure because 100 was supposed to be success. So success is not measured by what you've done compared to what the others have done. It's measured by what you've done compared to what you should have done. In essence, success is the fulfillment of the original assignment or purpose for which the entire test was given. Your life, therefore, is measured by why God created you, not what you've done. Let me try it again. Your success in your life is not measured by what you've done, but by why God created you compared to what you've done. In other words, you could be a complete failure and everybody else thinks you are successful because you didn't do what God purposed for your life. Conclusion then is that success is simply fulfillment and completion of original purpose. The purpose for the exam is for me to get 100%. I got 48. So according to the examiner, even though I got the highest score, everybody failed, including me. Because the issue is not my comparison to the others who got less than me, but my comparison to what I was supposed to have gotten. The purpose for the class was 100%. Everybody still with me? So success in your life is first of all discovering why did God create you? What was the assignment, the purpose for your birth? Why did you come into the world? And this is really the key to measuring your success in life. That's why God measures success this way. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. He says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you future and what? Hope. To give you a future and a hope. God has a future, a mark up ahead of you that's supposed to be what you reach. If you don't make it to the future that God intended for you, no matter how many people celebrated you, you are a failure. So success is measured by the future for which you was conceived. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10 says, If the axe is dull and the edge is unsharpened, much strength is needed. But with skill, success comes quickly. I love that verse. If the axe is dull means that if you don't know and understand the laws and the keys and the principles of success, you will work hard like a dull axe and still not get the tree cut down. You won't accomplish what you were born to do. So life is not really just about working hard. It's about working skillfully, smartly. And the only way to work smartly is to have knowledge of the law. Skill has to do with knowing the laws. A skillful mechanic can fix your car in one hour. You can sit by your car and be angry for two days. What's the difference between you and the mechanic? He knows the laws of the mechanics, right. So he can fix your car. So you can work hard and still be a failure. You don't know the laws. So what is the, 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 the laws we talk about? Why do we call it the keys to success? Jesus Christ said these words concerning living in his kingdom. Matthew 19, 16 verse 19. He says, I will give you the keys. Notice the plural word of the kingdom. Whatever you lock up on earth will be locked up in heaven. Let me explain what that means. He said, I'm going to give you some laws. Keys are laws principles. He said with these principles you can stop things from happening or you can start things to happen. And whatever you stop when you use these, these, these keys heaven will back you up. And whatever you allow heaven will back you up. In other words you control on earth what heaven does. Wow. I'm going to give you the laws he says by which you can actually bring heaven to earth. You can cause heaven to act on your behalf on earth. 
So whatever you start or stop depends on the laws that you disobey or obey. You can shut down things or open up things depending on the laws you obey or disobey. Is that clear? He's giving us really, notice he says, heaven will do what you do. Which means that he's telling us that this ain't up to God. Success is not up to God. It's up to you. If you don't know the keys, God can't help you. If you know the keys, God will help you. Why? Because God is a God of laws. He responds to laws. He, just like any manufacturer, you obey the laws in the manufacturer, they guarantee the product will operate. They support their product because you keep the law. So God says, I will give you the keys, I will give you the principles, the systems, the concepts by which we shall have success. Now, I want you to think about this now. Success, as I said, is not really something you pursue. It is a journey. It is a process. You will have success at increments on your way to your ultimate purpose. Success has more to do with moving in the right direction than coming to a destination. Success really is a process, not really a destination. When you make it based on the process to your ultimate purpose, then you are what you would call fulfilled, or you fulfill the assignment. If I got an A on that test, I would have fulfilled the assignment of the one who said the test. Maybe God does spank us when we bring 48% home. We are proud of something God's ashamed of. We tell God, look how good I've done. God says, you should see what you could have done. You settled for this? You call this special? You call this success? You embarrass me, he says. And that's why I'm going to share with you the difference between laws and rules. Very important. The secret to success, Joshua 1, verse 8. God told Joshua the secret of success. Here it is. He says, keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous. And you will have good success. God gave the responsibility of success to you. Not to him. Read that verse again. God says, it's up to you, Joshua, whether you succeed or fail. And it depends on what? What do you see there? Come on, say it loud. What does it depend on? Laws. Yeah, thank you very much. Laws. I told you that success is predictable. You could actually reverse this verse. Let, let, let us reverse it, okay? If you do not keep this book of the law on your lips, and do not dwell in it day and night and meditate and do not be careful to do everything in it, then you will make your way a failure and poor. Am I right? Yeah, it's reversed. It's predictable. So if you don't know the laws and don't obey them, then you can't pray for success. No one has ever been successful because someone prayed for them or because they prayed for it. Success is a result of obedience to laws. Am I clear? Okay. Why are laws so important? You can deal with this real quickly. Write this down. The key to life is order. Order comes from law. The source of law brings order. When you obey laws, you, you, you bring order to your life. The ultimate law, therefore, of life is law because there's nothing more important than law. What does law do? Laws protect, sustain, preserve, they guard and they promote life. If you obey laws, they'll protect you. They will guard you. They will preserve you. They will sustain you. And in the end, they'll promote you. If you always do what's right, I guarantee you, you will emerge to the top eventually. People who take shortcuts, people who sell drugs to become rich, or people who sell their bodies to pay their bills, or people who compromise in their, in their jobs to get ahead, don't worry about them. Don't. Jealous, be jealous of them. They will fail. They will fail. Because you cannot break a law. Laws break you. Write this down, please. Without law, there's no definition in life. Laws define things. 
You put a seed on a tile floor and leave it there for 20 years, the seed will stay there and no tree will come forth. Why? Because you violated the law of the seed. So the law defines, the laws define what the seed must do. You must put it in soil. You must give it moisture. It, there, there must be light, or sunshine or somewhere. Otherwise, the seed will never bring forth the tree. So you can pray over a seed for 20 years in the lobby on the tile floor. Your prayer, speaking in tongues, quoting scripture over that thing, casting demons out, will not bring that tree or that seed. Because laws cannot be substituted by prayer. Prosperity doesn't come by prayer. If you obey my laws and keep them, meditate on them, you will make your way prosperous. Prosperity doesn't come by prayer. It comes by keeping laws. Some of the laziest people in the world are Christians. And somehow their Christianity makes them lazy. They want God to do magic. These people are wicked. They look for miracles all the time. And we know what happened when those people asked Jesus Christ for a miracle. They asked him one time, show us miracles. He said, only a wicked and adulterous generation seek miracles. In other words, shortcuts. Hmm. One of the greatest temptations the devil levied on Jesus Christ was this temptation. He took him to the highest pinnacle and said jump that was a shortcut he said you won't dash your foot against a stone you won't hurt yourself in other words take a shortcut don't go through all that stuff about the cross and you know all the pain and the crucifixion and going to hell and rising he said look let's just get over it you, you jump now they'll believe you and guess what that was the biggest temptation you know that was the biggest one because Jesus said after that why tempt the Lord thy God in other words, the, the, the bread and the, and the power was okay. But this one, he said, this was, this was the temptation. The shortcut. The longest way to success is the shortcut. Tweet that to someone now. What did I say? The longest way to success is a shortcut. Shortcuts means you violate laws. The Bible calls this trespassing. You know, if you cut across somebody's yard instead of going around the main road, you call it a shortcut, don't you? Forget, what are you doing? Trespassing. And Christ says, forgive us our trespasses. <laughs> forgive us from trying to make life quick without going through the process of laws. Forgive us for trying to get quick schemes. And that's why people get into problems with business. People offer them all kind of quick, rich, 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 get rich quick stuff. You know, sell this or do this or do that. That's why gambling is really demonic. Not because you can't gamble, but because gambling encourages shortcuts. And a person who gambles, I guarantee you, they will always be poor. Even if they win once, they can be poor. Don't violate law. Now, I want to show you the difference between natural law and supernatural laws. Write them down. Number one, natural law is inherent in creation. That means it's built into creation. Number two, natural law establishes natural order. Number three, natural law regulates natural relationships. Notice the word natural is from the word nature. Huh? Natural, nature, nature. Yeah, it's built into nature. Natural law cannot be changed. Natural law is built in consequences. In other words, natural law doesn't need God to punish you when you violate it. For example, gravity is a natural law. If you jump off a 10-story building, God doesn't need to kill you. Why? Because the consequences of breaking the law is built into the law. Hmm. 
Can I suggest to you that God really doesn't judge you? The laws he established judges you. Natural law has built-in consequences. Next, natural law has inherent judgment. Again, it, tell, it tells us that it's predictable. If you keep smoking cigarettes, we don't need to wonder what happens to your lungs. You keep drinking alcohol, we can predict what happens to your liver. It, there's no question about that. Your liver is given to you to purify the blood in your body. If your body is filled with alcohol in the blood that you drink, the liver takes it out of the blood and keeps it. The alcohol burns the cells in the liver because of acidity and it becomes fried. It's called the cirrhosis of the liver. Now you end up with a fried liver that can't purify your blood anymore and the liver poisons you. The thing that's supposed to keep you pure becomes your poison. Why? Because the liver was never designed to extract alcohol. So you broke a law. It's built in judgment. God has never killed a smoker. God has never killed an alcoholic. God has never killed a drug addict. Never. God never makes you poor. You mismanage funds, buy things you can't afford, buy things you don't need. There's a law. There's a judgment built in. It's a law. Spiritual laws are very important. I just gave you natural law. Spiritual laws, number one, are established by God, the creator. And this is important. In other words, natural law and spiritual law have nothing to do with you. They are established by the creator. You didn't create gravity. God's wonderful design of the universe created gravities. Secondly, spiritual law establishes your conscience. There is a law in your body called the conscience. It's in your mind. No one has to tell you when you're doing wrong. There's a law in your body that tells you. You know when you ate too much. You know when you ate something that ain't good for you. The person who's smoking the cigarette knows the cigarette is bad. Their conscience tells them, this is bad. But the habit controls them. Your conscience is a natural spiritual law. And number three, Spiritual laws are inherent in the human spirit. All of us know sin. Even the guy who doesn't know God knows when he's breaking the law. There are laws built into our spirit being. Number four, spiritual laws regulate supernatural relationships. For you to relate to God, you have to obey some spiritual laws. First, submission. You got to submit to God. God can't help you if you ain't submit. Number two, you have to confess that you don't know nothing. That's a spiritual law. If you come to God as if you know everything, then why do you need God? That's a law. A law of submission, not just of your body, but of your mind and your intelligence. And the last one, spiritual law is built in consequences. The wages of sin is death. So when your forefather Adam sinned, God didn't put death on him. Death was built into the law. Let me quote God's word. God says, the day you eat this fruit, you will surely die. He didn't say the day you eat this fruit, I will kill you. <laughs> the dying was in the act of eating the fruit. In other words, disobedience has its own built-in consequences. God don't need to judge us. So that's how powerful laws are. Laws are so powerful. They have their own inherent judgment. You may think, for example, you're getting away with some private things God don't know about. God knows everything. You see what you're doing when no one's watching. And God has given you some opportunity to sort this thing out because eventually it's going to destroy you. And if you're having an, an affair with sin, flirting with sin privately, secretly, God don't worry about you. And God don't even judge you. It's built into the act. laws are inherent now the reason why I showed you that is because I want you to see the difference between laws and rules because there's a difference between the two and it affects your success write this down law 
is the inherent principles that regulate nature of life and relationships in God's creation. I'm giving you a definition of law. Law defined is inherent principles, that means the built-in principles, that regulate the nature of life and relationships within creation. For example, the tree relates to the soil because of a law. They have a relationship. If the tree breaks relationship with the soil, no one has to kill it. The judgment is built in it. The fish must relate to the water. They got to get along real well. If the fish decides, I don't like you no more water, you don't need to kill the fish. That's God never killed Adam. God says, look, your relationship with me depends on you not touching that tree. I ain't going to kill you. But if you violate that tree, that means the commandment of God. is not the tree. It's the fact that God told him not to touch it, the law. He says, I don't need to kill you. You will die. When a fish leaves water, you never kill it. It dies. When a plant leaves soil, you don't kill it, it dies. When a man leaves God, you don't kill him, he dies. Is that clear? So the relationship is determined by the laws. How many of you drink gasoline? Let me see your hand. You drink gasoline? Let me see your hand. Anyone drink gasoline? Hold your hand up. Anyone love gasoline? You like drinking? Hold your hand. Nobody? Oh, come on. You mean you actually go to a station every other week to buy this stuff, spend your money on You don't like it? You actually do something you don't like? Yes. The question is why? See, you should do many things you don't like because in order for you to get some defunction, you need to keep that relationship with the gas station. You relate to that station because you want your car to function. So there's a law. The law says cars need gasoline. And the station has it. So you got to develop a relationship with the station constantly for the rest of your car's life. If you decide one day, I ain't never going back to the station. Car says, then I ain't never driving no more. So you shut it down. So laws create relationship. Very important. Number two. Laws are both natural and supernatural, both physical and spiritual, to guarantee maximum fulfillment of purpose and potential. In other words, God created all the laws to work in your favor. The, the problem with life is simple, you know. We don't know the laws. So we come to life experimenting, guessing, hoping things work out. My real simple job for the rest of my life, the reason why I am doing what I do, the reason why you call me maybe a pastor or teacher, it's a simple job I have. My job is to teach you the laws. Every day I get up, I just teach laws. It, it, you know, <laughs> this is nothing about anointing and all that deep stuff. This really is about laws. You can have an anointed fool teaching foolishness. <laughs> you got some good preachers who ain't know nothing but the laws. They make you shout, ha, 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 In the end, you didn't learn nothing. No laws. You just had a good sweat. You're still broke, poor, depressed, frustrated, don't know how to succeed, and you've been going there for 50 years. Because it's not the preaching that sets you free. It's the truth of the laws that sets you free. And that's why we have this class. This class is about law. Let's talk about the law of nature. Law is essential to life. Law is necessary for all relationships. And the concept of need is the concept of law. Write that down. Need creates law. Your car needs gasoline, so there's a law established by the need. The fish need water, so there's a law established by the need. The plant needs the soil, so there's a law established by the need. You don't want God. You need God. That's why you come back to God. 
People think that coming to God is a religious experience or something. No, it isn't. It's you catching your senses, that's all. Without God, you can do what? Nothing, the Bible says. Without the water, the fish can do nothing. Without the soil, the plant can do nothing. Without God, you can do nothing, he says. This is not a matter of choice. It's a matter of need. You don't want God. Fish don't want water. It's a law. Write this down. Plants need soil. Fish need water. Birds need the air, the freedom. Trees need carbon dioxide. They don't want it. And humans need oxygen. And the problem with this is humans don't produce oxygen. And they need it to live. So there's a law. The humans got to protect the trees. That's a law. Every time you kill a tree, you're threatening your own life. So this is why governments are actually fining people who are cutting the forest. Because they are about to destroy human life on earth. And so actually there are countries like Guyana or Brazil or Colombia where the largest amount of trees exist in the world. They call the Amazon forest. That is really a oxygen factory. So the United Nations is actually paying these countries not to cut trees down. Isn't that amazing? Maybe the Bahamas should start a new industry, tree planting. You can plant so many trees on these islands that they will pay you to keep the trees. Because the trees are the manufacturers of oxygen which we need. Law. In other words, law can bring you money if you understand the laws. All right. Challenging laws. Now, when you challenge laws, you put yourself in a predicament. And I'm going to make a statement now. Please buy this CD, everyone, because what I'm saying is the key to your life. This whole CD is important for you to get. I'm teaching you stuff that took me 45 years to learn, and I'm giving it to you in 45 minutes. Write this down. Humans are the only created beings that willfully, intentionally violate natural and physical laws. We are the only creatures that do it. Fish never leave water. Plants never leave the soil. They don't challenge the law. <laughs> we are the only creatures God created that question the law, challenge it, violate it, intentionally, willfully walk away from it. We are amazing creatures. And that's why there is global failure all over the world. In every culture, every race, every ethnic group, people are failing by the billions because they disobey laws intentionally. All other created things submit to law. They obey natural law and spiritual law. You know, uh, uh, do you remember Lucifer? Lucifer was created as a cherub. Cherub. A cherub is an angel that was created by God to carry out certain responsibilities. For example, there are three cherubim that we know of. Cherubim is a plural word. Cherub means singular. The three cherubim, one we know of is Michael, right? The Bible talks about Michael. The second one we know about is Gabriel. It's a cherub. And the third one we know about was Lucifer. Now, all three of them was created by God for a specific purpose. Let me give you the purpose for each one. The Bible talks about it. Michael was created by God to be a warrior. He's a warrior. So at any time God wanted some angel to fight, it was always Michael who showed up. Gabriel never was called to fight anybody. Gabriel was created by God to be director of communications. 
every government needs a military they need a department of communications and they need a minister of culture guess who that was lucifer in charge of culture music you know sound okay if you study the bible whenever there was warfare that was needed michael showed up remember when daniel was praying who showed up michael do you know who cast satan out of heaven the bible says michael it's the fighter whenever god wanted someone to bring a message michael never showed up it was always gabriel in every place there's a message coming from god gabriel showed up it was gabriel who came to mary because he's a communicator he's the messenger lucifer was director of music and culture what did he do it was a law that you stay in your place he decided to remove himself from his position let me tell you what a demon is a demon is simply a person out of position you don't need to kill them they are naturally tormented tormented the word torment is what the word demon means demon means tormented one tormented one means somebody who's in a place where they're supposed to be so they ain't never comfortable now there may be demons in this room humans that's why you are tormented you are doing something you were not born to do and that's why you hate going to that job because you're not built for this job it torments you and you torment everybody in it too I know why I come here. This whole lousy job. I won't go home. When is lunchtime? See, you torment everybody around you. Why? Because you torment it. Because you are out of your purpose. It's a pleasure to be around someone who's supposed to be next to you. <laughs> My God. Some of you are smiling. There's some demons in your work when you go to work tomorrow. You, you know them very well. For 10 years, they've been complaining about that job, and they still wouldn't leave. This is tormentation. This is, this is tormented people. Why? They ain't built for this. It's not their gift. Not their gift. Am I making sense? So let's talk about the law of humanity. First of all, God created all things to live and function by laws. You said that. But God created mankind to live by natural and spiritual laws. And that's why all humans must learn laws for the relationships to be built properly. The reason why people fail is because they don't know the laws. And therefore, all relationships are products of law. How you relate to life depends on the laws that you're supposed to obey. Law is the key to success and prosperity. Do you ever wonder why God told Joshua... If you obey my laws, you will have good success. Do you know why? Because you can have bad success. He says you will make your way good prosperous. Why? There's bad prosperity. <laughs> a drug dealer has a lot of money, but he can't sleep. Why? Because the brother's trying to kill him. <laughs> he got to stay up all night watching his money. This is not prosperity. This is torment. Law is the key to success and relationships. And so, again, I encourage you to listen carefully during this series for the laws. And that's what we're going to learn. I was telling one of our ministers yesterday, I said, I will never be poor again. Impossible. Impossible. I will never be poor again. Why? Because laws are predictable. Laws give you control over life. Write that down. What did I say? Laws give you control over life. When you know laws and you obey laws, you control the, the, the outcome. There's a verse in the Bible that we don't even think about. Simple verse, you know, daughter. Jesus says, Jesus says, a farmer goes out to sow. He sows a seed. Watch this now. 
he says, and then he sleeps and he wakes and he sleeps and he wakes and so comes the shoot and then the tree and then the fruit. Now, what you didn't hear Jesus say is, he goes to bed and he prays and he fasts and he speaks in tongues. He did not say that. He said, he goes out and he sows the seed in the soil. Then he sleeps and he wakes. In other words, the guy doesn't think about it anymore. Why? I've done what I'm supposed to do. I obeyed the laws. I can go to sleep. You'll get it after I'm gone. I'm going to say it again. When you know law and you obey law, you control the outcome. The farmer doesn't have to pray for the outcome. So he goes to sleep and he wakes. After you go to the gas station and you fill your car with unleaded gasoline, do you pray for the car to run? No. No. Why? You obeyed the law. So you don't even pray. You just press the gas and you're gone. Why? It's supposed to work if I do what I'm supposed to do. Laws. Law and wisdom. It's very important. Knowledge of laws and principles are the source of wisdom. The Bible says... In all you're getting, get wisdom. And if it costs you all you have, get understanding. Write down down the scripture. It is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Write that down. That's one of my key scriptures in my life. One of my favorite verses in my life is Proverbs 4, verse 7. I live on that from a teenage. I still live on it. I'm going to quote it again. In all you're getting, Get wisdom. But if it costs you all you have, get understanding. He's talking about the laws. If you understand the laws, you become wise. Knowledge of laws produce boldness. Sometimes people think that you are wise. No, you ain't wise. You're just knowledgeable. It's knowledgeable of what? The laws. When you learn the laws of life, people think you're smart. You ain't smart. You just got a good memory. And you follow the laws. They call that wisdom. I can counsel anybody. I am being, I'm, I'm counseling people at the top of governments. And they think I'm smart. No, I just know the laws. I know the laws of leadership. I know the laws of communication. I know the laws of, of social development. I know the laws of family security. So I just repeat the laws. They think, oh, you're so wise. Hey, wise. I got a good memory. And they'll pay you for a good memory. Because the laws make sense. Am I still coming through? You all are quiet tonight, boy. Wisdom is laws and principles applied. Matter of fact, the three words you want to remember is knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, right? They're different. Knowledge is information, understanding is comprehension, but wisdom is application. You can actually know laws and don't apply them. The result is the same, huh? You fail. You know your gas tank is on E. You know that. But you could avoid gas stations. You know the car needs it. So you got knowledge. You understand the car needs it. You got comprehension. But you ain't got no wisdom. What is wisdom? Applying it. Going to the station and getting the gasoline. So coming to a class like this is one thing. Understanding what I'm saying is another thing, but leaving here, what you do with it is totally up to you. And wisdom is application. So laws and principles are more important than power. When a person knows the laws, they have power. When you learn the laws, you can demand your own value. Your car breaks down, the mechanic knows the law. The mechanic says, look, $300. He says, I don't care how you argue. You want car work? I know laws. So it's $300. See, when you know laws, you can demand your own value. I can almost hear you thinking. 
Why didn't I hear this 25 years ago? Because you were in the wrong place. Now you're in the right place. You are Diplomat Center at Bahamas Faith Ministries. You're in the right place. Give God a hand for being in the right place. All right. Laws versus strength. Now, notice I talk about laws versus wisdom. But let's talk about laws versus strength. Sometimes a strong person is not smart. Let's read what the Bible says in Joshua 1 again. God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. How? He says, by keeping the laws. Your strength is proven by the laws you know and the laws you obey. A strong person is a person who keeps the law. I ain't talking about ritual laws now, you know. I'm talking about the laws that God built into life, inherent laws. The Ten Commandments are actually divine laws. You can't change them. I was thinking the other day, and God said, do not kill. Do not kill. I was thinking, kill. That means anything that's alive could be killed, correct? You can kill a forest. Now, why does God say don't kill? Because when you kill, you affect everything else. You affect everything else. So these are divine laws. You protect life. You preserve life. Make your way prosperous. Now, I want to wrap this up with... The difference between laws and rules is very important. I'm going to give you the ten laws. We can close on that. And then I want you to don't miss a session. But we can deal with each law separately. So you can know them. Okay? Let's talk a little bit about this. True principles and laws are never broken. Violation of law is impossible. You don't break laws. That's number one. Number two... True principles and laws can never be violated. If you jump from a 10-story building, you didn't violate uh, gravity. Gravity violated you. <laughs> when you jump from a 10-story building, you didn't push yourself down. Gravity pulled you down. Do you, do, do, do you know the difference? You didn't fall if you jumped from a 10-story building. You were pulled down. If gravity didn't exist, you would have floated. Hmm. You don't break laws. That's number three. True laws and principles break those who violate them. Number four, the creator of true law does not have to impose judgment. These are important principles of violation of law. Number five, judgment is inherent in true law principles built into them. Number six, true law and principles attract and activate their own benefits. I like this part. And their judgment. I don't like that part. Can I say that one again? True laws and principles attract and activate their own benefits or judgment. If you learn the laws of life, learn the laws of creation, learn the laws of spirituality, if you learn them and you obey them, they attract benefits. If you keep my law, Joshua, you will make your way prosperous. That means you cannot fail. Failure and success is not up to God. God's finished. He's created the whole thing. He put it in motion. You buy a car made in Detroit from Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company builds into this car certain laws. It needs oil, it needs fuel, it needs transmission fluid, it needs radiated fluid or water. They decide that, 
and then they ship it out to you to the Bahamas. Okay, no problem. They say if you give this car everything it needs, all the laws it needs, laws, needs, right? Needs laws, it said it will function for you. No problem. If you want the benefits that are built into this car, they say, you must keep those laws. If you violate those laws, you attract what? Judgment. The car shuts down, doesn't serve you, you become a failure. It becomes a failure because you violate the laws. So, laws have their built-in benefits and judgment. What's the benefits of law? Number one, laws and principles protect the, the product. Number two, laws and principles preserve the product. Number three, laws and principles serve the product. Number four, Laws and principles guarantee product function. Number five, laws and principles simplify product operation. This one is important. If you know the laws, operation becomes very easy. You know, some of you got an iPad, you're working with that, right? You learn some basic things with iPad, right? That the laws are hard functions. And when you bought it, sometimes they have it built into the, built into the iPad. They have... Uh, 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 a function that says this will teach you how it functions. So you can press that and it teach you how this product functions. That is there to protect the, 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 the product from abuse. So laws and principles simplify product operation. Once you know the, how to operate by the laws, then you don't, you don't need to pray. You don't need to pray about how to operate your iPad, do you? Just learn the laws. <laughs> At least in number six, laws and principles bring peace and confidence. When you know the laws, you are confident. Why can I teach in this class with so much confidence? Because I know the laws and I know what I'm saying is true because I actually am a result of them. I learned them, tested them, proved them. They work. So I can speak with confidence. These laws work. Laws give you confidence and boldness. Number eight, laws and principles are the enemies of fear. When you know the laws of life and the principles of life, there's no fear in your life because you know what to do. Fear is evidence of ignorance. What did I say? Yeah. Write that down and tweet that to somebody right now. Hashtag Miles Monroe, please. What did I say? Fear is evidence of ignorance. Wow. <laughs> if you know you got $100,000 in the bank and everybody panicking, they ain't got no money, you, are you going to panic? Why are you, why, why you not going to panic? Now, they, you can't see the money, they can't see the money. But how come you're not panicking right next to them? Because you know something, that's all. Knowledge reduces fear. Jesus Christ had no fear of death. Now, that wasn't because he was God. He told us why. He said, my father told me that if I lay my life down... I could take it up again. That knowledge made him fearless of death. It was the information that gave him the confidence and the boldness. When you know laws, they cancel fear. And now you can see why laws are so important. Let me teach the laws of success. Law is the foundation, again, I repeat, of inherent, it's inherent in creation. It is the glue that holds the universe together. Everything exists by law. Everything exists on law. Everything exists for law. And without law, there's no success. Now, why is law so important? I want you to read this verse. That, And, and by the way, I'm gonna, I want to say this because right now there's some people preaching around the world about grace. I'm not against grace, but I'm against the teaching that grace cancels law. Be very careful. You overdose on grace and you start abusing law. Overdose on grace and success runs from you. You overdose on grace and you use grace to break law. 
Grace doesn't cancel law. Grace positions you to keep the law. Let me prove it. The first statement of Jesus Christ on earth, when he came to earth about law, is found in Matthew 5, verse 17. Read it aloud with me. Go. Do not think, he says, that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. And I tell you the truth. Watch this now. Until heaven and earth disappears. Is earth still here? Heaven still up there? Good. He says, until they disappear, not the smallest letter or the least stroke of the law will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. The earth still here. Wait, it gets better. Read. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these laws and teaches others to do them, to do that, will be called least in the kingdom of God. Read the last part. It's about me. But whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I'm a great man. Uh, are you great? Yes, because you learn how important laws are. You can teach others, right? You become a great. Christ says I'm great, not me. I am great in the kingdom of God because I teach you to keep law, not to keep grace. Grace forgives you so you could keep laws again. Yeah. Please get my series in the bookstore on law and grace. It'll help you. Now, I can't wait to get to this part here. Laws and tradition. Laws and tradition are different. Traditions can give you failure. Most people fail because of tradition. If you're going to be successful, you have to break tradition. Somehow we've made tradition and law the same. They are not. Let's read Matthew chapter 5 verse 20, the words of Jesus Christ out loud. Read. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will say not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that word righteousness means what? To be realigned with God's laws. So he's talking about the difference between tradition and laws. If you don't believe me, read the next verse. Matthew 15, 2. Read. Why do you disciples break the rules or traditions of the elders? Stop reading. Notice the word or between what? Rules and traditions. They are the same. Okay, read it again. Why do your disciples break the rules or the traditions of who? The elders. Who? The elders, not God. Follow me now. <laughs> you got to separate what man made from what God established. I guarantee you with all my strength that man has designed your failure. I don't trust no law of man. None. <laughs> this is very important what I'm saying. He said, they said, why do your disciples break the rules and traditions of the elders? Nothing to do with God. Read the next statement. They don't wash their hands before they eat. Sound familiar? Jesus replied, now he can respond to them, why do you break the laws of God in place of your traditions, your rules, your traditions? Wow. Help me, Lord. The difference between law versus rule. Get your pen. This is Fresh stuff of the wire. Remember this all your life. My cyber members, write this down, okay? What is law versus rules? Number one, a general rule or principle that is thought to be true or held to be binding. The world calls that law. It's a rule. Number two, in the world, let's say that a statement of a scientific fact or phenomenon 
that is, in, that is invariable under given conditions. They call that law. Now that's not necessarily true. Because God violated many facts. Like walking on water violated a scientific fact. <laughs> Opening the Red Sea. Some say they ain't real. It happened. <laughs> but God violated the natural facts. Number three, they say laws are principles set out in the Bible, especially the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, sorry, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, is the Pentateuch, the laws of God. They also say that, uh, that laws are a rule of conduct or procedure recognized by a community as binding or enforceable by authority. This is dangerous stuff here. Law is a rule of conduct or procedure recognized by a community as binding or enforceable by authority. This is dangerous stuff. For example, in America some years ago, they made a rule that black people were only two-thirds humans. That means they were half animals. That was a law in America, right? So they expected the procedure to follow that. That means a black man could never be treated like an equal human to anyone else. So he was sold like you sell animals. It's called slavery. Why? Because there was a rule that produced that conduct. Watch this. And it was accepted by the community. So the white community in America accepted the rule that black people were not humans. They were just partially animals. So to sell them and to treat them like animals, to beat them and to burn them and to brand them with a hot iron was just like branding a cow. It's not. After all, the rule is accepted the community that you ain't a real human. So the whole concept was based on a rule created by the community. And it was binding and enforceable by authority. That means authority gave you the right to buy a slave, to beat a slave, to brand a slave, and to sell a slave. The community made that forcible, enforceable. That's how dangerous the law is. Now, what happened to that? Well, you get people who rose up and says, we are against the rule. Why? Because there's another law. The law says that all humans are equal. Made in God's image. So they, they, they had to find another law. They got that law from where? Genesis, right? So they said, okay, we found a divine law that says all humans are equal. So the law became more important than the rule. I don't trust the rules of men. You can see why. The rules of men are designed to make sure you fail. And to keep you from pros prosperity and success. The last one is the most frightening one. They say laws are an act of, le of passed by legislature or a similar body. This is dangerous. A law is an act passed by legislature or a similar body like Congress or something. Now, that's dangerous, eh? They're making laws today, all kind of laws. <laughs> I don't call them laws, I call them rules. The Bible calls them rules and tradition. They are trying to make it a tradition that two men get married, for example. Two men can get married. They're trying to make it a tradition so they can become acceptable by the community. Remember, the community now is the problem. And they want to enforce it by authority. You have to marry two men if they come to you. Why? By law, they say. So there, you know, there's a problem in some countries where if two women come to get married, you've got to marry them. Why? The authorities have to enforce it. Why? Because legislature says it is a rule, which they call a law. Now, problem. They made a human law, but natural law disagrees. The two men can't have children. So your human law 
cannot stop natural law or divine law. That's why we teach in this church the divine laws. And I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, I am willing to die to protect natural law and divine law. I know you're clapping, but that's going to be tested one day. See? We can see if you mean that clap. Me? I already decided. That don't mean nothing to me when it comes to protecting the laws of God. So here's the bottom line. The difference between rules and laws. Number one. Laws are more important than rules. What did I say? Tweet that right now to someone and hashtag Miles Monroe. Number two, these are principles. Laws are different from rules. Number three, rules <laughs> these are retractions, customs, limitations, and boundaries created by men. That's what a rule is. Men retract from the divine laws. They create customs. They create limitations. That's what a rule is. It's a limitation. They create boundaries. A rule is not a law. It's not a real law. If man creates a rule, it is not a divine law. See, Man was designed by God to protect natural law and divine law. What man has attempted to do is to create a third set of laws, which are his own laws. And many times, those laws violate the first two laws, natural law and divine law. That leads to point number four. Laws should never be subject to rules. Martin Luther King Jr. said these words when he was fighting against the oppression of white domination in America. He said, there comes a time when it's legal to break human law. <laughs> That's an important statement. There comes a time when it's legal to break human law. So let's go, he said, let's go march. Let's shut down the country. Let's sit down on the buses. Let's shut down every restaurant. Let's don't go to work. Why? The law says go to work. That's a rule. But we say there's another law. We equal. So we ain't going to work. There comes a point where laws cannot be subject to rules. I'm talking about success tonight. And number five. Where there is conflict between a law and a rule, obey the law. What did I say? When there's a conflict between a law and a rule, obey the law. That might mean going to jail. Nelson Mandela went to prison because he broke a rule. And he broke the rule because he found another law. The law says all men are equal. The rule says they are unequal. He said, I'm going to obey the law and violate the rule. I'm going to pay the price. And number six, successful people always break the rules. <laughs> For the sake of the law. I remember when they said that no man could break the one minute mile. Was it, no, three minute mile. Like three, four minute mile. Yeah. It was a law. It was a rule. They made a rule. The human can't run faster than four minutes in a mile, they said. That was a rule. And then one guy decided, I'm going to break it. And once he broke it, everybody break it. Leaders are always rule breakers. That's why they're leaders. You can't lead by keeping rules. You lead by keeping laws, but not rules. 
The rules are made by men. We appreciate you. It's your love and your support that makes Miles Monroe International possible.